Hello and welcome to season three of the Gritty Hour. This is our first episode, season three, and we have some old friends coming back for this episode. Um, Co-hosting with me is an old friend who you've seen in a previous podcast, George Bauer, all the way from Las Vegas. Welcome, George. Hello, Tom. How are you? All right. We may have another friend of ours uh, coming in. His flight, he's flying to, from New York to Houston today, and I guess... Uh, he was cursing up and down Delta, so he, so he may join us in a little while. But um, our guest of honor today is Kevin Bryant, who is the author of Spies in the NFL. We've had him on in a previous podcast. And what we'd like to do today for our first, first episode of season three is, is discuss with Kevin and George and hopefully Rich um, how teams spy on one another in the playoffs, which are upcoming, and the subsequent Super Bowl. So it should be a very interesting hour. So welcome back to the Gritty Hour, Kevin. Mr. Bryant, it's it's a pleasure to have you back. Hey, thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Thanks for oh, having me on again. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Bauer, I th you, were, you were gracious enough to give us a, a code for the audio uh, version of your book, and I think Mr. Bauer uh, grabbed that. I did. So, yeah. Did. And, and if, I, if my recollection serves me well, your father did the audio? For that he did, book? yes. Yeah. 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 He was a he was a big help. I don't know. Man, he took he took on a lot of uh a lot of those jobs that nobody wants to do as an author. And uh including <laughs> including reading reading the audiobook. So Yeah. Well you were telling me uh right before we started recording that the sales have been pretty brisk. You had a good Christmas season with the book sales. They have been, yeah. Um yeah, it's it's been it's been real great. Um got on some pretty pretty big radio shows around the christmas season and that really helped boost it so you know being on an espn is never a bad thing in a major market absolutely absolutely so what we wanted to talk about today you, you brought up some interesting stories in the last podcast uh, that you were on and i think i already mentioned the link to that will be right in the show notes along with your website um some interesting stories about how teams spy on one than one another. I guess the it becomes more acute as you get into the playoffs and and the uh, you know the last two teams that play each other in the in Super Bowl. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head there because you know obviously the the desire to win goes up incrementally uh, mm -hmm. because now it's not just a finishing the season with a good record it is how do we how do we get to the big game and how do we win it mm -hmm. which is which is a big challenge and you know every opponent you play is going to be a good solid team and you know trying to find any little advantage that you can um it's a big deal it's yeah. a big deal and it can make the difference but i guess the count the counter spying is also ac acute during the playoffs too i guess teams are putting up defenses pretty well. Yes, precisely. Yeah. Um, so everybody's aware that, you know, teams are, there are going to be those teams that are, um, that are looking for an advantage, some mm -hmm. that are willing to stretch the rules of play. And so um, teams are absolutely, um, you know, engaged in a whole variety of countermeasures. And we can get into some of those today. Sure. Uh, you yeah. know, the types of things that they're going to do to try to, uh, you know, to, tr to try to keep their secrets uh, in house. Yeah. Georgie boy, your, uh, your team made it to the playoffs, didn't it? They did. They very surprising. The New York giants are, are in for the first time, I believe since 2015 or 2016. So considering it was a new year, a, a new coach in its first year and general manager, it's, it's kind of impressive. So I'm very excited. I don't know how far we're going to go, but we'll see. Well, it depends on how well they spy on the other teams. Absolutely. You don't. You yeah. don't. They, they don't know yet who they're playing, right? That's isn't there still one more as we're recording? Uh, one more week there, left to the are, regular. There are like two possibilities, I believe. They're locked into the six in the first round, and then so they would play the number two. Uh, so I believe it could be San Francisco or Minnesota. I think Philly's got the the top seed uh, locked in. So we're going to, we're going to either San Francisco or Minnesota. It looks like right now. Kevin, as George was just talking, I, uh, it, the question came to my mind, 
are, the, are there some teams that are better at it than others in terms of how they eyeball each other? Absolutely. And so, you know, what you'll, what I found through the research of my book is that the teams that are winning Super Bowls on a, on a regular basis are those teams that um, some of them, a lot of them are the ones that are willing to stretch the rules. You know, you look at a lot of the great coaches throughout the history of the NFL um, that have won repeated titles or at least that are in the hunt consistently. And they've been those guys that are willing to. Uh oh, freeze frame. <laughs> okay. Kevin, uh, you froze up. So we'll. Uh... Stretch the balance. Um, Al I mean... Davis. I didn't mean to inter- I didn't mean to interrupt Kevin, but you froze up for a second. So if you want to just restate what you were talking about, okay, here we go. All right, so yeah, a lot of the uh, the great coaches throughout the NFL's history have been um, that have won Super Bowls or at least ha- are routinely in the hunt. Have been those guys that are willing to stretch the boundaries um, of fair play to include George Hallis with the Bears, Sid Gill with the Chargers. Weeb Eubank with the Colts and the Jets, Al Davis with the Raiders. We've obviously got Bill Belichick today. Um, but, you know, there are tons of stories as well of, you know, coaches that have won the Super Bowls, you know, the, the incredible security precautions that they have taken to prevent opponents from spying on them as well. Well, uh, take us through exactly, like, mechanically, how would one team spy on? Like, say, how would the Giants spy on whoever they're going to play in the first round of the playoffs? Yeah. So I would say let's take it one step back. So, you know, instead of using the term spying, let's talk about how they're going to gather information on their opponents because that's where it's going to start. So do you need to, you know, the first question becomes, do you really even need to get into the dark arts of spying, right? Um, And maybe you do and maybe you don't. What you want, though, is information. So the first thing you're going to do is any team is do your advanced scouting, which can consist of sending scouts to watch their to watch games live and obviously watching the, the film of your opponents. And what you're looking for there is a few things. You're looking for strengths, weaknesses, tells and tendencies. Okay. Strengths and weaknesses, obviously, those those speak for themselves. Uh, tells are, you know, just like a, a poker player uh, may have some tells that gives an opponent hints about what, what his hand may be. You know, maybe the guy has a nervous cough whenever he has a good hand or, you know, or has a big smile on his face, whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes football players have these same types of things that can – give away clues about what the upcoming play is going to be. Um, And then tendencies. Tendencies are the big one. And this is something that NFL coaches spend a ton of time in the playoffs, and especially before the Super Bowl, trying to figure out what are the other team's tendencies and how do you exploit those. And if you want, I've got some stories there that I can share with you. Oh, sure. Yeah. Let it, let them rip. Yeah. Okay, so one of the one of the bigger ones um, was right before the 2016 Super Bowl between the Broncos and the Panthers. Now, this was a game where you had uh, Peyton Manning going up against Cam Newton and Cam Newton, you know, Peyton Manning's on the twilight of his career. Cam Newton is tearing it up. And everyone's trying to figure out how do we slow this guy down? Because he set league records. He's doing great things. So Wade Wilson, the defensive coordinator of the Broncos, went into the film room along with the staff. And they learned a few things through film study that no one else in the league had. One was that Cam Newton doesn't like to run unless it is a planned run. Right of a runner as as he was the mm-hmm. second thing they learned was their offensive line it was considered really strong that year but the reality was they were using a lot of double teams to prevent any any pass to negate any pass rush on cam newton and so 
what Wade Phillips and the Broncos did going into that game was they said, you know what? Okay, so let's basically rush as many defenders as there are offensive players on their line. So meaning that if they brought in, you know, extra tight ends to pass block, that Broncos would just say, you know what? We'll just take another linebacker and push him up to the line. And however many they defend, we're going to rush with that many. And it prevented any team. It prevented the Panthers double teaming the Broncos. And with Von Miller and Marcus Ware one-on-one, DeMarcus Ware one-on-one, it was just too much. It was too much. And, you know, and Cam Newton got pounded time after time. And the Broncos forced a ton of turnovers. And this is just, you know, one example of how studying another team's tendencies can prove huge dividends if a team can exploit those. Interesting. Um, You mentioned about viewing film and viewing previous games. Is it frowned upon for the scout of one team to be at the practice of another in between rounds? Yeah. So if you're talking about being at practices, that is generally – well, okay, so it's typically not allowed. Okay, so if, say the Giants. If the Giants are preparing for a Super Bowl and they're practicing at their home stadium, um, they're not going to let any. They're not going to let any opponents in. Okay. Now, what happens from time to time is that teams will have a walkthrough practice at the Super Bowl facility at the stadium the the day before the big game now occasionally teams will hold back-to-back practices meaning one team will practice and then the next team will practice well what that allows is the opportunity for the first team to leave some people behind (laughs) out in out in the crowd Uh and this has happened you know before the patriots and rams played after Spygate all came out and the Rams and Marshall Falk came forward and said, you know what? We think that the, the uh, Patriots ended up filming our practices. Well, that's not what happened, but what happened was the Rams had practiced first, had planned to employ Marshall Falk, their Pro Bowl running back in a bunch of new ways that he hadn't been used in the regular season or in the playoffs. And a couple of the Patriots videographers had been or had remained behind, witnessed all of this, and then went to the hotel and reported this information to the Patriots defensive coordinator with everything that they had seen. So it does happen. Um, this was reported years later to Roger Goodell, who just basically said, yeah, that's nice. I'm not doing anything about it. Mm. Okay. Um, teams got to be aware that that sort of stuff is possible. Um, they didn't make any effort to the Patriots videographers didn't make any effort to hide who they were. They had Patriots paraphernalia on and, you know, it was Patriot, you know, Rams should have been aware, been aware of it and taken the appropriate measures, I guess, to kick them out. Um, so it does happen. It does happen. Did you know that much stuff went into each game, George? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have a question concerning the Super Bowl because typically uh, when there is a bye week, when the league had bye weeks, Mm -hmm. the teams would fly out to location early, like a week early where they would, I guess, contract through the NFL, a facility that they were able to practice on, usually the college facilities. And so – Is the team responsible to secure that or does the league get involved with those type of practice facilities or liaison? I know all the teams have contacts or have hired FBI agents or people, high ranking people from police departments to work for them on their staff. I mean, how involved is that? And and what do they do in those uh, when they're off site in like uh, in different cities and stuff? Right. Yeah. Great question. So NFL security. Uh, does have personnel that are, you know, that will investigate um, matters, but they're not typically involved in anything like, um, you know, securing, ensuring that a team's practice facility is secured. They leave that up to the teams. Mm. 
So, so I'll give you an, an example. So because teams do to go to very great lengths that week uh, before the Super Bowl, typically they practice in the city they're going to play in the week before the game because they have all types of interviews to conduct and all of right. the Super Bowl festivities, right? Right. So, so this was a concern before the 98 Super Bowl uh, when the Broncos, Broncos were going to play the Packers. So Mike Shanahan was the coach of the Broncos at the time. So the, the practice facility that they were using had a big hill overlooking it. And Shanahan was very concerned that the Packers could potentially put a spy or two on this hill to be able to watch what the, what the Broncos were doing. So uh, Mike Shanahan actually went out and hired um, a, he hired 18 Navy SEALs to actually <laughs> secure the hill and to ensure <laughs> wow. right, that no one could spy from it. Oh. Um, so, you know, it, it does get really cr crazy the lengths that teams will go to um, to ensure that these facilities aren't spied on. You know, what they want is they want facilities that have good fencing. Uh, if they can't get good fencing, they'll find ways to put up you know, netting or tarps or even park buses in strategic locations to block views, okay? They're worried about surrounding hotels around the practice field or b yeah. tall buildings overlooking it. So they're going to just an incredible amount of detail. You know, it almost comes down to like how the Secret Service will try to protect the president and see where are all the lines that, you know, a sniper could potentially be to be able to right. shoot the president. Well, these are what NFL teams are doing to think about spies looking for areas that they could look down and spy on the field. And those are the extents that teams are going to to try to prevent it. Yeah, well, the, 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 the close, the further you progress in the playoffs, the more the more uh, higher the stakes become. So I guess the higher the defense and the and the attack becomes in that regard, too. Right. That field you just mentioned that the Navy SEALs had to secure, was that a college field? You know, I don't remember yeah. off the top of my head whether it was or not. Um, mm -hmm. It's very likely because that's frequently what teams will use for their, um, you know, for their away game uh, practice facilities, but but not always, you know. And I would say that's always the big challenge for uh, for teams. You know, when they practice at home, they've got all – everything's very routine. You know, when it comes down, how are they going to practice? Uh, how are they going to defend their, their facility? They've got all these policies and measures that are already in place. So, you know, not to say it's not possible, but it's, it's much more difficult. When teams are practicing at away facilities, well, there's a lot of things they can't control. You know, we saw this, we saw that this year when um, Tampa Bay, or no, it was the Miami Dolphins. Uh, before they played, I think it was the Miami Dolphins. It was a Florida team. I think it was, uh, they went to play uh, Cincinnati, the Bengals. And they were practicing at the University of Cincinnati. And someone from, someone who was there at the university facility ended up taping the practice and sticking it on, I forget what it was, YouTube, Twitter, something like that. And the team asked them, uh, it ended up being put on a website. The, the team, I believe it was the Dolphins, asked the website to take it down. The website was friendly to the Bengals and said, no, we're not taking it down. And all that <laughs> practice footage, it's going to stay up there and anybody who wants can watch it. Wow. And so, you know, it is tough for away teams. It's tougher for them to secure their practice facilities. Yeah. Well, you know, I was looking at George and I was thinking, because George is located in Las Vegas, I was, I was just thinking is there's got to be a lot of odds makers that try the same thing that other teams do in terms of spying on each other. They, they, they must have people out in the field trying to gather the same kind of information that the opposing team is trying to gather. You know, the people that make Absolutely. the odds. Have, yeah. Yeah. There, there's always, everyone's looking for an angle and, mm -hmm. uh, and, when Vegas was the center of uh, sports betting, which I guess it still is, but it's certainly expanded. Many, many states now have the ability to, to 
to to to bet on sports and uh but there's always got you know there's always guys you know I follow some guys that uh that sell picks and tend to be experts gambling experts and stuff and the and they always they always talk about meeting with people in the sports books like the uh the executives in the sports books they they have ears on things usually it, it comes around to injuries maybe unreported injuries or someone's not really feeling uh well or maybe he's got a stomach virus the night before the game uh because they they're, they're always trying to uh, get the line to the favor of the books you know the books the books want to win just like everybody else wants to win and uh, any any little angle whether it is to win a bet or in the in the case of these teams to win the game they give them that advantage they're always looking for it it involves money so it's it's always it's always a big deal well, Kevin, I think you you might have touched on some of the countermeasures. I think that that one is taken on by the league itself. The countermeasures in terms of uh, uh, Vegas odd makers, odds makers. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, when it comes to um, dealing with the gambling world, um, that is absolutely something the NFL NFL security tackles. They want to sh- ensure that all games are. Um, not tampered with that there are no um you know whether it's players or coaches um trying to um you know throw games or shave points and that um you know no outside entity gets involved in trying to pressure in, into pressuring um teams or coaches or players to do likewise so that absolutely is a, a nfl security um uh function but you know, to go into something that you know George was talking about with the, with the with the media, um, that is that's a very big concern of NFL teams and especially prior to Super Bowls, because you know it's not just you know there are fans that can get out there and leak information like I just mentioned earlier with the University of Cincinnati, um, but also um, you know the media itself, you know sometimes. Um, very much, you know, on accident, not on purpose, will leak information. And that's a big concern for NFL teams. And, um, you know, to give you an example, prior to the the 94 Super Bowl, um, the Cow- Cowboys coaches were hanging out um, watching the news um, when a, a, a Bills, a, a reporter came on um, from a Bills practice. And in the background, while the reporter was talking, they saw Jim Kelly throw a shovel pass to the running back Thurman Thomas. Now this is something that the, the, the bills hadn't done all year. So the Cowboys coaches said, huh, we haven't seen that one. So they prepared for it. And as a result of it, uh, as a result, when the bills actually ran that exact same play during the Super Bowl, the Cowboys were ready for it. Um, they hit Thurman Thomas right after he received the ball off this pass and ended up causing a fumble. It was a very big play during the game. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, there are examples of that over and over of the media giving away information that proves to be critical for playoff games and for Super Bowls both. And this, this is something teams are looking for that information and teams are very much trying to prevent other teams from gathering that as well. Now, in that instance, uh, did they couple that with the, as you were talking about earlier, picking up the nuances? Like, how did they know when that was going to, that when that play was going to be put so in it motion? All, you know, it all, so I don't know exactly, but I'll tell you just, you know, from my research and what I know about football. So it's all about <clears throat> formations. It's all about personnel. It's all about how they line up. So you may know, okay, you look at what did they, when they ran that play, what did they have? You know, what was, what formation were they in? How many times are you going to see that same formation? Maybe three, four or five times a game. So, you know, anytime they line up like that, you go, okay, we need to make sure we're watching for that shovel pass. And so, and so, you know, that's inevitably what they did and, and, and how they figured it out. Wow. Well, that's interesting. I want to touch on the, let me touch on the media for a second too, because not just the Super Bowl, but many, when you, uh, there are requirements for the media and the coaches staff and some of the players to meet ahead of a game. Mm-hmm. And they talk about things. And the, a lot of these, particularly the uh, 
the color men are former players. So they have connections with the team too. So every once in a while, I, I notice where a color guy, before a play happens, they'll come on, well, well, watch for this. Or they were out at practice and they saw something and they don't, they have some inside information. They usually don't, they don't talk about it until it's, a, until they see something or, so they try to keep it as quiet as possible. But there is, there is that element too, that the media is trying to find out information about what's going to happen to make them look better and look, make the announcers look smarter, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, teams are very leery, especially of talking to media members or allowing them access to their practice that are outside of the city that that team represents. Mm -hmm. Because then you're really worried about where that person's loyalties lie. And that's right. very hard to determine, especially before a game like the Super Bowl, when you've got, you know, just media by the hundreds, if not thousands out there trying to get their scoop. So, that's a big deal. Um, and so, you know, as a result, obviously teams try to keep footage of their practices out as much as possible. And while coaches and players are forced to talk to the media per NFL requirements, um, you don't get a lot of good information out of them during these talks because they're very leery about sharing it. And, you know, I've got a pretty funny example of that. There was a, uh, a press conference before the a 1968 Super Bowl. And sports journalist Jimmy Cannon asked the Raiders coach, Johnny Rock, um, if I held a gun to your head and you had to answer the question, what do you do more on offense, run or pass? What would you say? Remember, there's a gun at your head and you've got to answer. And so Rush replied, I'd say we tried to balance our offense. And all the media members in chorus and replied, you know, bang, uh, <laughs> meaning, you know, you're dead because you know, you're not willing to answer that question. Yeah. So even a question as simple as do you run or pass more? You know, coaches just aren't even willing to go there um, because everything is hush hush before the big game. Well, I have to ask you, Kevin, in your research, I know you did a lot of research for this book. Uh, Spies on the Sidelines, The High Stakes World of NFL Espionage is the name of the book. Um, in your research, like say, I don't want to insult George, but say the Giants lost in the first round in the playoffs. Let's say they won and they were playing the Bengals. I don't know. Um, the you team know. that lost. <laughs> that would be really hard. <laughs> I'm sorry, Georgie. The team that lost, uh, would they do you think, like, say say they were going to play the Cowboys the following week, okay? Mm -hmm. Would the Bengals, being the loser against the Giants, would they, what would their proclivity be to share what they do know about the Cowboys to, to either the Giants or what they know about the Giants would they share with the Cowboys? Do, do you get me? Yes, I get you. So, um, it's very possible. That's the bottom line. Uh, so teams in the past that have been targeted um, for being, well, for a variety, I'll give you two examples. Um, the Browns, when they first came into the NFL, you know, they were headed, they were led by head coach George Brown. And everyone wanted to prove that the um, NFL teams, the original NFL teams, were much better than the new teams that had come into the league. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they, all the NFL teams in the lead up throughout the playoffs and going into the Super Bowl shared whatever information they knew about the Browns with the team that was about to play them. Uh -huh. um, likewise, a very similar thing happened to the Patriots after Spygate. Everybody hated the Patriots. And they said, you know what? We'll just give you whatever you want on the Patriots because we don't like them. So it has happened in a very, I would say, kind of formalized manner like that in the past. What typically happens, though, is that there are all these relationships within NFL coaching staffs because a, you know, a current assistant coach on the Cowboys, for example, has probably played, has probably coached or at least been on the staff of at least three or four teams if not more. 
And so he has all of these relationships. And so what might happen is a coach from a team that's about to play him, that he was on another team staff, might call him and say, hey, Todd, what do you know about these Cowboys? What can you share? Or Todd might even call the other team just because he wants to tell his buddy, hey, guess what we learned about, you know, the team you're about to play. Mm. And so there are all these, you know, relationships and informal means of communication between teams and a sharing of the information that goes on all the time in the NFL, not just between coaches, but between players as well. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, it happens. And, it, and, it, and it's not unusual for uh, for teams to p- to pick up players or pe- people that have been waived or no longer playing for the Patriots, an example, and bring them in and like uh, try to g- try to get intel on certain trends and and uh, things they like to do. So you know, you mean what they knew about their old team, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, if, if you're let's let's say let's say the Cowboys, you know, so Patriots release some player and you know and. Cowboys have a game coming up with the Patriots, you know, they, they can pick that player up and, you know, and, and sign him if they want to sign him. Maybe there's other reasons they want to sign him, but if they do sign him, they're certainly going to talk to them about the trends of the, of his old team, you know, because it, it, it just makes sense that you're going to try to find, you know, you have a source now to, to coin a phrase and uh, getting information on the enemy, so to speak is. Yeah. Important. I think, I think Kevin had mentioned that in the in the, the uh, when the book was first came out when he was a guest on the podcast, mm-hmm. he did mention, or did you? The some sometimes they'll pick up a player specifically to get what he knows about the team he's coming from. Yeah, absolutely. That happens all the time in the NFL. Um, some teams use that tactic more than others, um, and some teams are a lot more effective at using it at. at than others. Um, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. The, the Patriots, you know, they were known during the Spygate years for um, taping other team signals. But one of the reasons that was effective for their team, because other teams had done the same thing, right? The Cowboys with Jimmy Johnson said, admitted that, hey, we did the exact same thing in the past, right? But we found that it wasn't that useful. Where the Patriots were really good at that type of stuff was they would use tactics like signing players from other teams and then showing them the signals that corresponded to that play that either they had picked up um, maybe through advanced scouts or through taping their, you know, the signal sent in on the sidelines. Um, And so they would use the debriefs with players brought in from other teams as a way to confirm information that they had and potentially to, to gather more information um, that, that was brand new. So those best teams, it's not just about using one technique. It's using two, three, four techniques. Because if all you've got is, you know, one source or one means of information saying that, hey, the Bears are going to do this next time you play. Well, is that true or is it not? And how much time and effort? Are you willing to invest preparing for something that you're not even sure if it's really true? Right. Now, if you can confirm that, well, that's a whole different story. Now mm. it's worth spending that time and effort to prepare. And that's where the Patriots were so good and really had a leg up on the rest of the, uh, the rest of the league because they had, they weren't just willing to go beyond where most teams were willing to go to collect information, but they were willing to, they were so much better at assimilating the information than other teams were going to do because they knew how to analyze it properly. Well, that's a good point. And I was, uh, it, it, uh, it made me think um, the poor bastard that's getting picked up by a team Um does he does he generally know he's getting picked up just for what he has in his head rather than how fast he can uh, run down the line? You think so, he, knows, yeah, you think he cares as long as he's getting paid, right? That's exactly it. Most yeah. don't care. So mm-hmm. what you'll have is these guys that know that they are getting signed for that. It's not a big surprise to them. And the you know within the first few days, typically they're going to start you know having coaches rifle through their brains trying to figure out what they know about an upcoming 
you know, sure. team component. They know, oh, gee, I just got signed seven days before we play this team I just got signed from. It's, it, it you know, it's not a surprise to them. Right. There are some players. So having said that, there are these players that are signed for legitimate reasons because they're good players and go to a new team. Um, this happened to Eric Weddle, who's, you know, Pro Bowl safety in the NFL for a long time. When he was when he got signed by a new team and his, you know, his his new team asked him basically to, hey, share what you knew about your old team. And he said, you know what? I don't want to go there. He said, you know, he said. They were really good to me. The team I used to play for, I've got nothing but respect for him, and I'm not going to do it. But this is a guy who's a perennial pro bowler, and they have the luxury of doing that. For most players that are just, you know, trying to get one more NFL paycheck and trying to hang on to a roster hand, tooth, and nail, they don't have that luxury. Right. And if ratting out their former team is the difference between them sticking around and them going, they're going to rat them out every single time, seven days a week. Mm. Yeah. That's a shame, but I, I can understand that. Um, I guess if somebody gets signed, that's uh, from a team that one, like the jets are playing next week, a team and the jets sign this guy from that team. And then two days later he gets released again. Then, you know, he's a principled guy. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. That happens all the time. And yeah. so, you know, coaches are aware of this. So they take countermeasures to, you know, okay, what do we need to change? Mm -hmm. And it, it depends on who the player is and what he may know. You know, if it's a quarterback, holy cow, you've just, you know, this guy's going to know everything about your offense and it becomes a nightmare. Right. You know, if he's a, if he's a wide receiver who knows, okay, he knows the wide receiver routes. Okay. Well, all right. Let's, let's adjust fire as, as needed. Or maybe not because maybe the coach is going to go, you know what? Yeah, he's going to give away some information, but if we try to change things, it could mess up our own team. Meaning we try to change the signals, we try to change plays, but then can the players on our team remember this new information and adjust in time? And those are the, the tough choices that coaches have to make. Or maybe even you can try to set up your opponent, and this has happened, where the opponent thinks they know what's about to come, and you line up just like it's the old play right but instead of it being a short run you now sneak the running back you know out of the backfield and go for a you know 30 40 yard pass to a wide open receiver because it's no longer a run it's a pass play you know mm -hmm. a, pay, a play action fake so you know there's a lot of ways that, that coaches deal with all of that um, right. right but it's just it, you know it's just a lot of time and energy coaches have to devote to dealing with all of these tactics I wouldn't think it would be the head coach that would be dealing with that, right? It would be some of his assistants that would, I mean, the head coach mm -hmm. isn't going to get into the minutia of, you know, this guy tugs on his Jersey every time he's passing or that kind of a thing. Right. I would, it's I would think his assistants would be the offensive coordinator or the defensive coordinator. Yep. And so you've got whole staffs working for those offensive and defensive coordinators as well. They're going through the film of your upcoming opponents um, oftentimes weeks in advance, they begin pre preparing um, to help to help the coordinators prepare the game plan. And so and so they're looking for things like, you know, what are these tendencies, all of this? And they're, they're helping their coordinators out, uh, preparing it along those lines. Um, but having said that, you know, everybody in the NFL who is part of a team is watching film. The players are doing it. The scouts are doing it. The, you know, the coordinators are doing it. The head coach is doing it. Anybody can be somebody who notices something like this, you know, notices something that could, hey, uh, we need to be aware of this. We need to watch for this. Or maybe we can, you know, adjust this play and do. Um, it's a team effort. It's a team mm -hmm. effort. Ultimately, yes, it comes down to the coordinators typically to make these adjustments. Um, but it's, it's, it's the effort of a whole bunch of people coming together. I have a question about film. Uh, is that controlled by the league, or do uh, how is how is the film gathered and distributed to other teams? Uh, yeah, is there, is there a system in place for this? Or there, there is. So they, the NFL has what they call the NFL Dub Center, and so uh, what was that again, Kevin? The, the NFL the, what? NFL. I, I, 
I'm pretty sure it's called the NFL Dub Center, D-U-B. Oh, D-U-B, okay. Yep. And so all the footage from all the games goes to this Dub Center, and they make it available to all of the teams. And so um, they can watch it, and they get a, they can watch a version that is um, – it's, it's, you know, it's not the TV version. Right. Um, it's, it, you know, and it has more angles that, um, that you can watch it from. And it's pretty good. And it's what coaches use, generally use to um, watch footage. Having said that, there are services out there that are subscription services that allow, and a lot of teams use these, that allow teams to do things like, to enter data into a database that is searchable. So let's say the, the Cowboys are about to play the Giants and they want to see, hey, I want to look at third and one. I want to see every single Giants play on third and one from the 2022 and 2021 seasons. Well, they enter those parameters in the computer. They hit search and it comes up with 25 plays and then the coach can go through and watch all 25 of those plays and say, okay. And, it, and they can even potentially say, you know, it, it may even tell them on the screen, this third and one, they ran this play, this play, this play. So maybe coaches may not even need to watch the plays to know, you know, what type That's of play on. had occurred. So it's a great way for coaches to quickly learn the tendencies of their opponents to develop cheat sheets so that when a third and one does show up, they, they can look at that cheat sheet and go, oh, 70% of the time, the Giants run the ball up the middle. 15% of the time, they're going to run it out wide. 5% of the time, they're going to try a screen pass. And so, and they play the percentages a lot of time. They're going to go, okay, well, we're going to stack the D against a run up the middle because that's mm -hmm. what the Giants normally do. And, and so that's how they look at it and that's how they figure it out. And using those films and those subscription services just saves them a ton of time of not having to go through and compile all of that information on their own. So the subscription services, they have access to the games in addition to the channel, the to TV play. station that's showing the game. There's other cameras around the sidelines that. Yeah. So they can potentially, you know, teams have access. Typically they'll have access to, um, uh, you know, official footage that the NFL provides. They've got access to games that are recorded uh, by local, you know, new, by local or national news stations. And sometimes mm -hmm. the reason those are used is because you get sideline shots in those games that you don't get right. in the official NFL footage, right? And so mm -hmm. if you want to maybe try to leave, read the lips of a coach who's calling a play, or maybe they're sending in a hand signal or, you know, um, whatever it may be, you know, the quarterback is, you know, mouthing, um, you know, uh, an audible call that the official footage didn't pick up. So teams go through uh, the local, the, the news footage to try to find all these little helpful, you know, tidbits that they can turn into information to be able to, you know, use on their opponent. So the subscription service that these teams are uh, subscribing to, they're they're just they're gathering all the film that they can gather for every game over the course of the last five years, let's say, and categorize it like third and one. They they you can access it via computer. And that's that's the big advantage of it is it is already in a format that is easily searchable for for coaches and teams and right. that's the huge that's the huge benefit of it right there and that's that's the reason that teams pay for it because you can get that you can get you know news footage that that's not a problem to be able to get for nfl teams right they're, they're gonna they're gonna get their hands on that no matter what um mm -hmm. but to be able to get searchable you know searchable fields of these games that's just a godsend for these guys right. but I, I, think, I, I think these guys could follow the coaches even if a Shanahan, for example, that you brought up before, Kevin, he was, I believe he was, he was with the Redskins for a while and then the, Bron the Broncos or vice versa. Uh -huh. And they run this, he runs the same type of offense. Yes. Uh, so you could, you could, you could look for the coaches yeah. trends too, not just the team's trends. Depends on the coach, the coaching staff. 
Yeah, you are absolutely spot on there. And um, he, yeah, I mean, there's there, you know, to go outside of the NFL, you know, my next book I'm working on is college football. And there's, you know, a pretty famous uh, coach at Texas, Texas Tech went on to uh, coach at Washington State. And that is exactly what he did. He, you know, he brought his old signals with him when he went to Washington State. Um, and as a result, you know, I have it. Yeah, Mike Leach. And I have it, you know, from from another coach that I interviewed who told me all about how his team gathered that information um, and came up with PowerPoint presentations of, hey, here's the play and here's the signal. And he was using it at Texas Tech and he's still using it at Washington State. And so, you know, it was a huge advantage for them. And they pulled off a huge upset based on this type of information. So, yes, knowing what coaches do from time to time as when they move teams can prove very valuable. And, you know, when the Broncos, when Shanahan moved from the Raiders to the Broncos, uh, he was formerly the, um, wait, do I have this right or do I have it backwards? I think yeah. he finished with the Broncos. He, uh, yeah, he was with the Broncos. So it, when he moved, he ended up um, taking the same um, – I can't remember where he was. I may have teams, but I know when he moved from one team to another, he used the exact same signals as before. And a member of his coaching staff that he was on before saw that, realized it, and started giving the defensive coordinator all of Mike Shanahan's upcoming plays that he was calling because they figured it out. They're like, oh, well, this is the same stuff. So what? yes, go, going back and watching, you know, and knowing the tendencies of a coach at another team, it, it can be very advantageous. Do you think a guy like that, uh, this is a head coach you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. You think a guy like that would be conscious of that and he maybe change up his his tendencies to, you know, be aware that yes. other teams are going to follow what he did in the past, you know? So that was one of the more surprising things that I found in the book was that some coaches – are very, very good about changing up everything, you know, like your, your signals. Um, and some coaches are not, and some coaches quite frankly, don't care. Um, like, um, Bill Walsh, who was with the 49ers and a great legendary coach. He just didn't care. Frankly, he was just like, you know what? We're so good. You can know what we're going to do and we're going to beat you anyway. And some coaches have that philosophy, especially some of the great coaches throughout NFL history, George Halas was one of those guys who was just like, look, we're going to run the ball. You know, we're going to run the ball. We're going to run it down your throat, but we're so good. You can't stop us. And I don't care if you know what's coming. And that's that. Mm -hmm. Tom, some team, some teams actually script their first 10 or 15 plays and they don't get away from it either. Unless something, something happens. But uh, also when, Teams will run those 10 or 15 plays and they'll pick the ones that work and then they'll just, they'll go back to them later in the game. It's, it's, it all, de it depends. And it depends on personnel too. Do you have a guy that can, yeah. you know, do you have a guy that could get around the end and, and, and run outside a Tiki Barber type, for example? Uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of factors involved, but uh, coaches are very strange. <laughs> and George, those, those scripted plays become a big target. Because yeah. there you have, you know, kind of the holy grail of what's up and coming. And anyone who can get those hands on those sheets, um, it becomes, it can become a big advantage. And so one of the things that the Patriots during the Spygate years were accused of, and that some of their anonymous assistants revealed to media members, um, was that Patriots used to send people into opposing teams dressing rooms and and take those um scripted sheets and and then you know and if you know if you can learn 12 or 15 plays which some coaches will literally call in order unless it's like a third and one situation right, right. they'll call them in order and you know exactly what's upcoming Man, you know at least at least a quarter's worth of plays in order of what you're about to face, which is a massive advantage. Um, and so, yeah, that's absolutely, you know, paperwork in the NFL is very, 
is always has always been targeted. Well, when it comes what to if, playbooks, play sheets, anything like that. What about how plays are actually written or, you know, called? I mean, uh, do teams do it differently? If I'm a, if I'm a coach with with the Redskins and I get a sheet from the Seahawks, am I going to looking at the way that the the uh, play is listed? Am I going to know what that is? Or are there certain terms that I have to look out for? I know, I, I think every team or every type of offense does it differently. Yeah, so, you know, what you're going to end up with, like a playbook, for example, okay? okay. It's going to have basically where everybody lines up, and then it's going to have a bunch of arrows to where the players will go for that play. So in that sense, they're all very much identical, right? right. Every team pretty much does that the same. Mm -hmm. What differs is the play calls mm -hmm. or the signals, which are really the same thing, right? Really? Uh, a way of conveying what is the play that is that is going to be ran. And so teams have different names and different signals to try to keep other teams because if everyone called it, you same know, right. if everyone called the play the same way, right? All you would have to do is read that person's lip, overhear a play call, or intercept the signal and you know exactly what's going on so that you know they try to mask that and hide it um mm -hmm. sure. and everyone will say well you don't need to do that nowadays because you have headsets well true and not unless mm -hmm. your headsets go out unless someone can read lips which teams do use professional lip readers and unless your headset is compromised which is a very real concern as well. Mm -hmm. So for all of those reasons, uh, teams still still make sure that they all have um, you know, play calls and signals that are unique to their teams when 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 you know calling plays. Uh, one question I had, Kevin. Let, let, let me precursor by saying I, I asked my good friend George to help me co-host this. He's known me since I was 12, so he knows football to me is something to keep me occupied between the World Series and spring training. Um, but a team like he mentioned before, his his team, the Giants, uh, haven't been in the, in the playoffs since 2015. Now, does a team that's there just about every year have an advantage over a team like the Giants in terms of spying? Like they have a more honed system in place, does that does that come into play? Um, so you know, yes and no. <laughs> so what I will say is that any team who is perennially in the playoffs has an advantage, um, just because they know how to do everything. They already have a template in place, so they're prepared for it. You know, a new head coach heading into the playoffs. Ooh, okay, we're gonna make we're gonna make make everything up from scratch. From how are we gonna run practices? What are we gonna do? We, what's our hotel policy before the games? All of this stuff is new for them, including, you know, potentially, how are we gonna go about gathering information on our opponents, and how are we going to get go about protecting that information? Right. And um, so it is a little it is a little tougher. Having said that. You know, most things, most games during the playoffs are fairly identical to the rest of the season. The, the one area that is different is when you have a bye week. So, um, you know, if you get a one or two seed and you have a bye week before your first game or the week between the Super Bowl, that gives teams an extra week to prepare. And teams that are used to having that and know how to use it do have a very big advantage there because then you're going, okay, what are we doing with that extra week to collect information on our opponents using permissible means or maybe not, or maybe just means that are questionable, such as how do we elicit information out of our opponent? Like, hey, uh, Bob. Don't you know someone on the Rams who are about to play? Why don't you give them a call and strike up a conversation? You haven't talked to them in a, you know, a, mo a month or a year. Say hello. See how, <laughs> see, how his, see how his wife's doing. Yeah. Say congratulations for making it to the Super Bowl. And then 
if you happen to be able to turn the conversation to it, here are some things we'd be interested in knowing, yeah. right? And so teams that have that system in place and that have done it before and know what they're doing definitely have an advantage when it comes to uh, gathering information. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, um, I'm talking to Kevin Bryant along with my co-host, George Bauer. He's the author of Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. Um, this is the playoff version. When did the playoff start, men? Uh, is it two the weeks? Fifth, is a, it the, the last the week of the regular season's coming up? And well, then, uh, well, let me just say, we're, as we're recording this, it's the fifth of January. Um, but this will come out probably the fifteenth of January. Is that the first day of the playoffs? Fifteenth uh, or sixteenth? Sounds about right. Sounds yeah. about right. Does that sound right, Kevin? Yeah, that's that's roughly. Yeah, I don't have a date off the top of my head, but yeah. Well, Kevin, I'll ask you first, um, knowing what you know with the research you did on your book, who do you think has the best shot? <laughs> well, I said before the season began, and it's still my feeling that the, the Bills are the team to beat. Um, having said that, uh, the Eagles have looked incredibly good this year, and I, I did not – I mean, I expected them to be – a good team, uh, an up and coming team, but my goodness, uh, they have been a force to be reckoned with. So that is my Super Bowl prediction is Bill's Eagles. Having said that, you know, uh, the Chiefs look really good. Um, and once you're in the playoffs, by golly, anything can happen. You know, you mm -hmm. just got to get in the tournament. And once you're there, um, all you got to do is get hot. And, <laughs> um, and it happens to, you know, to teams year after year that are, five or six seeds that are suddenly right in the thick of the thing, right in the thick of things when it comes to the playoffs. So it's, and, it's always hard to guess. And Georgie, I know you're a fan, uh, but you're also armed uh, having read Kevin's book. What are your picks? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say the giants, the last two Super Bowls that they won, they went in as the wild card. Yep. So uh, that once you, it's just, it's uh it's the old uh, Parcells. I don't know if it was Parcells. It might have been, you know, uh, survive in advance. That's all it is. Survive the game and get to the ne and get to the next one. That said, uh, I don't think you can you can bet against, bet, bet against the Chiefs. I mean, they've been there enough. Reed is a genius, yeah. and uh, he's got the tools. Uh, there was nothing that that Chief Bill game last year was one of the best games you'd ever want to see yep. uh so but philly philly looks tough you know uh so i i would probably go chiefs eagles in the and what Super about Bowl. buffalo as kevin mentioned buffalo's right there with the chiefs you you, mm -hmm. you know you can't argue with that uh they're going to have the uh i don't the chiefs i'm not sure which team is going to have the whole home field throughout uh i don't have it in front of me but uh one of them will Buffalo's weather recently has been awful. Not that Kansas City doesn't get any snow or cold, but uh, Buffalo is brutal. And if you're used to it and can play in that weather, it certainly gives you an advantage. Didn't they move a game out of Buffalo recently for because yeah, of that Detroit. storm? Yeah, they moved uh, one of the games to Detroit because it was just. Wonder how that affects uh, all the all the all the preparation that a team goes through, including spying. Wonder how that affects that. Yeah, it's. That... it's... It's really tough. You know, like I was talking about earlier, that game uh, for the Florida team after, you know, it was it was because of the because of a hurricane that had passed through. And so the team had to go up early when they were playing the Bengals and practice early. And, you know, the University of Cincinnati, uh, you know, practice field. And that led to, you know, them being spied on by a fan. So it, it is tough. It throws off. It throws off everything, you know, it throws off your schedule, your routines. It makes you more susceptible to being, you know, to an opponent gathering information on you. Um, it's tough. And you know your weather sucks when you go to Detroit in the winter to play there instead of in Buffalo. My God. <laughs> <laughs> it's that lake effect, Kevin. You know, yeah. uh, wh where is the Super Bowl going to be held this year? Los Angeles. Ah, well, there's no threat of snow there, I don't think. And the way things are going, there's no threat of even rain. No, no, I'm sorry. That was last year. It's going to be Glendale, Arizona. 
Oh, even yeah. less threat of snow or rain. Yeah. 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 Uh, Kevin, I have to ask you, because you did so much research for this book, which is a phenomenal book, and any football fan, I think, should pick it up. Um, do you watch games? Because I know you're a football fan as well as the author of this book. Do you watch games now with that mindset? Like, I wonder... I wonder what they're doing to each other or how they found this out or that out. Do you, when you're watching a, a ball game, do you have that mindset? You know, not most of the time. I mean, I know it goes on, but you know, most of the time I'm, I'm watching it like a regular fan. However, there, you know, there are times and we all know um, uh, when you, you just, you know, a team has another team's number, you know, they've just got an opponent's number. It's like the other team can't do anything right. And that is not a coincidence. Um, that is a, one team doing a lot of homework. And they do. They absolutely they know what's coming. And when you know what's coming, if it is two relatively equal opponents, it is not going to be good for that team that has been found out. They are going to get uh, beaten and potentially destroyed. You know, uh, there have been coaches, you know, talking about how just, you know, just because a game ends up 52 to 14 does not mean that the two teams are so, are, are really, you know, that there's a big talent difference between the two. It can simply come down to something like having that information on another team and having them figured out that can, can be that difference between a 15, 14 versus a 14, 14 game. That's mm -hmm. how important information is. And I've got an example in my book of how one team during the first, they played, they played the same team twice during a season. The first time they played, they lost just barely, but they taped the other team's signals. And so for the second time they played, they knew every play that was upcoming. And as a result, they won the game. Like it was like 62 to seven or something like that. And so, you know, they lose one game and then they win the next one by 50 some points. Mm -hmm. And that's how big of an advantage it can be just having gathered that information on your opponents. And so, you know, it's, it's vital. It's mm -hmm. vital. Yeah. Well, you could still pick up the book uh, before you get too deep into the playoffs by the time this airs. Um, so I'll ask Georgie, uh, George, the information that's in the book, does that add, subtract, or are you neutral when you when you just watch a game as a fan? It's all, it, it's in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when certain plays happen or it, when, when the defense seems to be uh, ahead of the offense on, on plays that, well, maybe they knew something. So, yeah, it's, it's in the back of my head. It, I, I, I think about that now as I watch the games. But that uh, – Kevin's book – uh, adds to your enjoyment of the game, I would think. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Some yeah. great stories, some great stories. And I'm looking forward. The next one is going to be on college football, correct? That is correct. That's the plan. I have quite, do you have a, are you going to do a chapter on the teams that put those big signs with the four, <laughs> the four boxes and they have what that makes no sense to anybody else, but the team. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, the NFL has gone to headsets, right. Which is, right. so there's not, there's not nearly as much signals use as there used to be. Uh, but college football still uh, does not allow headsets for coach to player communication. So yeah, you have all these interesting signs being held up. And so, yeah, um, I'm, there's, there's a quite a few, you know, it sounds a lot like the same topic, but there's so many differences between the college and the pro game. Um, that are really fascinating and affect the way that spying is done um, between, between the two that, uh, yeah, I think anybody who enjoys, enjoys football on the subject will, will enjoy the next one coming up too. What's Good. your ETA on that? Or do you have one? I'm trying not to put myself under that pressure. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm a part-time novelist. It's something I enjoy and love. And mm -hmm. as soon as I start putting dates on it and the pressure of it, uh, it becomes, it becomes a job and not a, uh, uh, a work of love. And right. um, so uh, having said that, I'm, I'm envisioning probably uh, another year of working on it. And then okay. it generally takes about an close to nine months 
uh, to go through the whole publishing process. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it's still it still weighs out. Hopefully, there, my uh, uh, availability availability of the of the of the NFL book. Can you go over that for everybody? How do we get it? Yeah. So, um, so it's available on uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, um, any major book retailer. You can order it online, and um, I've got everything that you want to know about the book. I think uh, I think Tom's kind of been rolling through and showing. Uh, yeah. but my website, it's fives on the sidelines.com. It's got, you know, all your ordering information. It's got all my social media handles and all of that nonsense. Um, and, um, yeah, so the book's out, it's out in hard book and ebook as well as audio book. So, um, and I, the audio book is roughly half the price of the other two. So, you know, if you're looking for a good deal, that's, that's the way to go and grab it. My website's got all the sites. You can get it no matter what format you want it in. Right. And there'll be a link to your website for those that are listening, uh, not watching on YouTube, but listening. Uh, there'll be a link in the show notes uh, to spiesonthesidelines.com, which will then link you to all of the places that the book is available. Um, not to put you on the spot, George, but how did, uh, how did Kevin's pop do on the audio version? You absorbed the audio version. I did. He, he, he did. He did great. He, right. did, he did fantastic. Just a shout out to Mr. Bryant, right? Absolutely. Yep. Appreciate it, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you for your time tonight. And when uh, we'd certainly like to have you back when the college, uh, the spies on the college sidelines comes out. Hopefully our other friend, Rich, will have landed by then and we'd get him on to <laughs> help co-host. But I do appreciate you helping me, George. As you know, I'm a baseball guy, so having a football guy in helped me a lot. But uh, as I said before, this book, this uh, podcast will come out. You'll have plenty of rounds of playoffs left and the Super Bowl, so you can grab this book now. You'll have it in more than enough time to um, augment your enjoyment of the playoffs coming up this year in 2023. So thank you both gentlemen. I appreciate your time tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing both of you down the road. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Okay, men.